And now, here's your host of Shaping Success, Wes Tankersley. What is up, everyone? Welcome to Shaking Success. I am your host, Wes Tankersley. Today, we have a great guest for you that I actually met out on a sales, a sales call, and it just turned into a great conversation, and I had to have him on. He has his own podcast called The Engine of Matt Todd. It's a great one. You should check it out. We'll talk a little bit about that and his story. So here we go. What's happening, man? Yes. Thank you, Wes. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, you know, it was, it was pretty cool. I was... It, we just, you know, you run into these people all the time and I was over at your house, you know, just getting your quote on some blinds and stuff. And it was just crazy because it just, you end up having a conversation with people and then you just, you're kind of attracted to the same type of people. So, um, found out you had a podcast and started listening to that. And we talked a little bit about it and just decided, Hey, we gotta, we gotta do this. So yeah, yeah well, game recognizes game, baby. You know, you got, <laughs> it's, you know, what's blown me away about being in this community is that there's so much, I mean, the whole aspect of your show here, shaping success, what does success mean and how do people achieve it? And all those things. It's like, there's so much opportunity for success everywhere. And it, it's almost like, uh, yeah. Have you ever heard of a, uh, the paradox of choice? Uh, I haven't. I okay. So look, um, the idea is this. Okay. If you have two types of genes that you can pick from, you're like, eh, I kind of like this gene or, or that gene, but you know, you only have two. And if you only have one, that's even better. Cause you're like, well, look, this is trash, but it's, you know, like it's the pair of genes that I have an option to purchase. Right. So you don't even think about it. It's not something that, that pops into your head, but the more options you give people, the worse their decisions become and the worse, uh, the worse their satisfaction becomes. Right. So like, if you go to subway, you can make something like 15 million different types of sandwiches if right. you run out all of the different combinations. And it's the same thing that happens in, in like you buy a speaker. You go to like, well, when people used to buy speakers at like, you know, Best Buy or something. Anyway, you, you set up all the different cables and, and receivers. The more options you give people, the more likely they are to regret their decision yeah. and the less likely they are to actually make a decision. Because I think everybody's gone to the store and been like, there were too many options. I just got overwhelmed and I left. Well, there, if there was only one option, you would have just bought that and you would left. And you're right. like, that's oh, trash, but whatever. So I think that I've been thinking a lot about your podcast and why, why it's so attractive to help people understand the nature of success. And I think it's because people have so many opportunities for success. It's overwhelming. They're like, there are too many avenues I can take that lead presumably to a good outcome. Right. And they just, they, they end up freaking out. They like short circuit. They're like, I don't know. I just, I left. I couldn't, I couldn't buy the jeans. I couldn't do it. It's kind of funny because you were talking about that. I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about a customer that I had yesterday and this happens all the time. Like you go in there and you're like, well, I want to see options. And then you give them options. You're like, well, I want to see all these colors of this. And then you go and show them to them and then they can't make a decision. You're right. And that's why like, I'll bring in one sample pack and I'll have them look through it. And then I'll just start taking stuff and putting it away as they go through it, because I don't want them to look at more. And I'm like, that's the one. All right, we're good. <laughs> yeah, it's like, nobody wants to see options. Like yeah. they just want to be happy. Right. Like when right. you're trying to, I would, I would work with people, uh, in, in SAT prep for almost 20 years. And people were like, well, how, how does it work? I'm like, it, it only works one way. And like, this is the way it's the, kind of like Mandalorian. Like, this is the way, right. Trust me. <laughs> right. And they're like, well, we want this or we want that. It's like, well, that's fine, but that's not me. Right. And, and it brought the simplicity to the process that not only it, it satisfied parents because they felt good about uh, about what the product was going to be. And it satisfied the students because they didn't have to worry about it. You know, like the more, especially with teenagers, the more wiggle room you give them, the worse it becomes. It's like, no, yeah. look, Sparky, you're having peanut butter and jelly all day long. That's <laughs> it. They're like, no, well, it's kind of is what it is. Um, if, if I may ask, if you went into a house and you were trying to sell somebody blinds, right? Like how many different options for blinds do you think you could oh, offer man, you people? You saw my truck. The whole back end of that thing is full of samples. I mean, there is probably, I think I probably have 40 sample books between oh. three different brands. And I just kind of, I kind of try to go in there and figure out what they want. And then, you know, I can I just kind of qual pre-qualify before I bring anything in. And when you go into one that says, well, I don't know what I want. Then I start to kind of explain, well, this is the difference between blinds and this is the difference between shades. And they're like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I just want to do this. And I'm like, all right, so now you want to go with shades because you don't want to control light. I mean, it's 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 a process that over three years of doing it, it's it just it gets 
you know, as a teacher, and that's kind of what you are too. It's kind of the same thing. And I just like to educate people on what they're doing because I think if I educate them up front, then I won't have to educate them on the backside when they call me and they say, well, what about this? You know? And I, I think that's really the process. It's like, you tell them there's lots of choices, but you can really narrow it down to like two or three before you have to bring everything in. Because the last thing I want to do is lug in like nine sample books, you know? Right, right. And I think that's one of the uh, one of the great uh, defenses to having too many options is, look, I don't know what I want, but you can establish really quickly what you do not want, right? And once you n know that you don't like this or you're not interested in that, all of a sudden your number of options is like it's 10% of what it used to be. And then you can start to to hone it in. But that do you think that there's an aspect of okay so you're dealing with things that consumers are going to see every single day and interact with every single day on the interior of their home right so like there are very few things that you sell people that are that intimately connected to them on a daily basis right yeah do you do you think that as as the consumer world has increased in in quantity and nuance that people have people have felt an obligation to get their product reflecting their personality even more right they're like which blue reflects my mood or like which right. which green kind of goes with this and like oh i'm not i heard i heard somebody say once like oh i could never do that i'm just not that person of like we're talking about you know like a table color or something right but it's like that the table color becomes the person they're dealing with and you you do the exact same thing, right? Like you're dealing with like, no, no, no. I could never have like summer colors in winter or something like, I don't know. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is like, it's, it's more of like they, people need to understand that. I don't know. It's kind of funny. Cause I talk to people about this all the time. Like I walk into their house and I'm like, they're like, well, I want this one to match my bedspread. And I'm like, okay, so are you going to have that bedspread for, you know, one year, 10 years, 20 years, <laughs> as long as you live here, because if that changes, then why would you put something there that matches that? Why don't you put something there that is super neutral and then you can just match it, you know, match it to like permanent things like flooring and cabinetry and things like that. But yeah, you give people too many choices. It's like I walk in like vertical blinds, right? You know, the old school one, two and a half inch slat, three and a half inch yeah, slats right. lay down. There used to be like two colors. There's white and off white. Now there's like, I have five little books inside the thing that, and there's like 200 choices. It's like, how many choices do you need? You're right. <laughs> I think we've right. over, <laughs> no one liked this one. So we better make them something that they do like, Oh, they didn't like, Oh, let's give them more. It's yeah. Cho that's a it, very interesting topic that I could just go off on. This choice thing is just crazy. It's like, it's nuts. Yeah. Well, uh, do you remember that scene from my cousin Vinny, right? They go to the little diner and they sit down and they, they get the menu and it's like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> and he's like, gee, honey, what should we have? And they, they order the breakfast. And it's like, you'd think that people would be happier with more options, but they're not. Yeah. They're not. And that's, that's that again, coming back to this, it's like, I feel like young people and then people in their twenties trying to find a position. Like if, if somebody asked you when you were 23, like, Hey, Wes, do you want to be, do you want to be like a blinds guy, which is obviously a very fine life for you, right? Like you as a person now, I, I doesn't seem like you hate what you do, no. but you were like, Oh no, no, I don't want to do that. Or like, Oh, I don't know. Because I think ultimately what they're saying is it's the same as dating somebody. You may even think it's a tolerable choice, but you're worried that there might be something better. It's like, you slimy bastard. It's the thing like, with life. This, yeah, right. And it's, again, there are too many options. It's like this, this ham and cheese sandwich is really good. There was a, there was a chef that, um, that was being interviewed. I, I remember um, some years back, <clears throat> just like famous French chef. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they asked him, they're like, hey, what kind of food do you love the most? And he's like, you know what, honestly, sometimes like a baguette and like just the right butter like you're not gonna beat that and if you break it down and really think about it, it's like yeah like sometimes you just get this fresh baguette with this like epic salted butter just right there's no way you could beat that and yeah. you know it's that simplicity that brings this obvious satisfaction but it's, you know, if you have to look at the entirety of the culinary world, especially French cuisine, it's like, what do you like the most? What are you going to be most happy eating? Right. Well, I mean, good luck with that one, man. Yeah, it's like in and out You know, you walk in there, you can have a double-double or you can have a regular cheeseburger and that's it. And then you get the fries and then, yeah, I'm sorry. I know that's a hard one. I, I no. we, we are going to be getting one here soon, okay? 
if that's what you're getting it's, at. It's really painful because it's it's a hundred percent right. Like <laughs> you're not messing around with like the McFish sandwich, whatever right. it is. Like it's just you just you have a burger and it's like you look, you want two patties? I'll give you two patties. Right? You want four patties? Let's get crazy. Yeah. You want a you want a flying Dutchman? That's fine, but like <laughs> just the most simple stuff. And, and like Louis C.K. had this great bit about uh how how the people have more now than they've ever had and they're just like pissed sitting right. on the tarmac because the wi-fi is taking like 10 seconds longer than oh. he's like you didn't even know they had wi-fi until two minutes ago and now you're like it's not loading and it's just right. a piece of crap it's like give it a break it's going to space and coming back <laughs> and you're just trying to play candy crush or something like oh. good god and then we flew you flew through the air and you're mad about your stupid little rectangular glowing screen that's not loading fast enough. It's like, you need a donkey. You need a yeah. donkey in like clay <laughs> vessels carrying your water, you toolbox. Yeah, it, it, it's freaking crazy the way that this world is now. <laughs> well, here's something weird too, because you're you're about my age, right? Like we're both in our late thirties, I believe. And, it, and it's like, we were the last generation to really be integrated with zero tech and then full tech. Right. Like if you go 10 years after us, those people found out about computers when they were in like their late twenties and they're like, what? Like somebody's going to email me. And if you're like, you know, 10 years younger, you had a, you know, iPhone rammed in your diaper walking around your house. Right. It's like the age of, <laughs> I don't know, whenever you had diapers, it doesn't matter. But the point is like, we're the last people that really saw the world functioning both ways. And it's, it's so funny to see that. It's like, how are you upset about this? Like, right. go get lost somewhere on a hill, son. Like, what are you, did you not happy your iPads and like on 17% battery? Well, maybe because you played it for three hours. I'm a terrible parent. I'll admit that right now. <laughs> like, the point is, <laughs> like, everybody needs a break now and then. Yeah, for sure. And we yeah, have that you, choice. Uh, <laughs> we did. Yes. Yes, that's the, that's what I'm saying. I feel like we intimately understand that we could get lost on a hill riding our bikes or we could play a little computer. Like I I used to like uh, – you ever play like MMORPGs, like uh, mass multiplayer online or, or things like that, uh, like, World yeah, of, like World of Warcraft? Oh, yeah. No, you know I never really got into that. I okay. Didn't. So I'm I, kind of – I, I know a, what you're talking about. <laughs> So I had a hot minute where I was like, oh, this is awesome. And like, I really, I really got into it, but it, it, it's, I feel like younger people feel they can't live without it. And I feel like older people have no idea what it is. So we have the great benefit of seeing both ways. That's all, yeah. that's all I'm getting at. And we're, no, and we're more versatile. It. It's, yeah. It's that super overstimulation that we have created for ourselves, which, you know, like you were talking about, like my dad, oh, someone's going to steal my identity. And we're just like, oh, did you order that on DoorDash? Let's get everything we can get here, you know, like, because we can get it to our door now. And stupid COVID has made it like, screw this. I'm not going out to eat because I can just have it come to me. And then now we don't interact anymore. And it's crazy. Yeah, there was a there was an SAT topic that um, an uh, essay writing topic, one of the prompts that I used to uh, have students practice on. And it asked about if we are slowly losing our humanity with technology and students didn't really understand they're like well what do you mean losing our humanity like which is like it doesn't matter there's like i was like but look this is what you got to realize i used to do you guys you like chipotle you chipotle yep. fan okay great okay god bless it so look <laughs> i was like look i got the chipotle app right and i run hot and like was always driving around and seeing students students so i'd use the chipotle app to order and then go grab it right it's yeah. it's fantastic ready to go but Exactly. But what I told my students is that's that's the nature of losing your humanity because you no longer are waiting in line. OK, so you're not you're not participating in the social agreement that we're all going to wait in like a queue very patiently and not like get pissed off, which is right. which is a thing. Right. Like you got to be patient. Oh, 100 percent. And then you have to have. You have to have these menial type interactions with the person with like the beans and the rice. And you're like trying to convince them to make you a quesarito without charging you an extra 250. <laughs> and it's like, so like, I'm always really nice. I'm like, well, I really like the melted cheese, but I don't want to pay like the $4. And they're like, I'm sorry. And you're just like, you have these little interactions. And then you get up to pay for it. And you're like excited. I was always like really excited because you ever see people who get exactly what they want and they get to the register and they're just pissed off. It's like, you know, you could have told me 
you didn't want the Pinto. Like, why aren't we happy when we get to the end of the line? And this is like, you're chatting with a person paying. You lose all of that if you order off the app. It's like these people at Chipotle are no longer human beings. They're just assembly line workers that you don't even have to like look in the eye. You just walk in and you wait there impatiently looking at your phone and then you grab the stupid bag off the shelf and you leave. And it's right. like that's a loss of humanity that I think people aren't really recognizing. It's like this slow drip, just like sealing your pebbles of humanity. Right. Exactly. Well, let's talk that's a little a bit time. about let's we could talk about this all day, but let's talk a little bit about you. <laughs> Cause I want to, I want to, I want people to know kind of what you do. So you have your podcast, but let's talk about where it all kind of started. You went to, you went to Berkeley and it sounds like you were a rower. I would have guessed that you were a wrestler. Yeah. Well, uh, so I wrestled in high school. I was not a good wrestler. Okay. I was a swimmer, a water polo player and a wrestler. I was ex- extremely scrappy, but I was tall and very skinny. So I was like six foot one, six, two and 158 pounds. So again, not, not the classic, you know, short stocky wrestler, but again, very scrappy. Yeah. So I go to Cal, I I'm on the rowing team there. Randomly enough, um, Cal has an, an incredibly good rowing team, uh, world-class quality. So I rode for Cal. I ended up doing well on it and not well enough to go on to the, to like the national team, but I did win the the college me, national championship. Let me ask you yeah, a question sure. about that real quick, because rowing, like, did you do it before college or is that something like you just go to college and you, and you get on that? Cause I don't really, well, obviously in Idaho, we don't have that, <laughs> yeah. but I know in California, like they have water, pol- like you're talking about water polo. I don't think yeah, yeah. there's a water polo team here either. But that's those are the types of things that are down there. How did you get into rowing? Was it something just happened at college or were you doing it before? That's a great question. So rowing is one of the last world class sports that you can essentially walk onto in college. Like if you're if you're a tennis player, if you haven't been playing tennis since like negative two years old, you're not playing in college. So like that's just the nature of the sport. I mean, they have you know, like seven and eight year olds go into like three day tournaments nationally, you know, so for tennis, that's a really difficult thing, but for rowing, essentially you need somebody that's tall enough. So again, I'm six, two, I was the shortest guy on the team and you need that person to have an incredible, uh, cardiovascular system and i was a swimmer and water polo player and again wrestler and rowing races are between five and six minutes long so that co- uh, coincides with the wrestling time frame so all of that worked and then you just have to be able to to eat a lot of pain because you you get a you, ever, you remember that movie uh princess bride yep back in the day right old school yeah. <laughs> and uh that you know that machine that like sucked his life away they hooked him up the torture machine they're like oh, not yeah. to 50. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's essentially anybody who's jumped on a rowing machine for any length of time realizes is just this hellacious experience but it's using your largest muscle group so it's right. it's hammering your legs it's hammering your back so unlike swimming where you know it's almost all upper body it's like 10 15 percent legs once your arms go and your shoulders go, that's it, right? Like if you're doing pull-ups and you get to 10 pull-ups, you can't do an 11th pull-up. That's it. There's no real discussing it. Right. But if you're doing something like air squats, you can keep doing air squats. It just really hurts. Yeah. And that's kind of the nature. That's the nature of the rowing machine where it's like, hey, you can keep pulling on this handle. Like there's no question. You just have to want to keep pulling on the handle. So for me, I, I had a, a a great cardiovascular base and and understood you know lactic acid thresholds and I could just chew a lot of pain. So I ended up essentially walking onto the team at Cal, and the I was an, again a novice, so never rode before, and I ended up making the boat my freshman year, which was I just barely made it in. But I beat out all these other you know successful high school rowers, and then it just that started the long slog through the rowing program because. It's it's wholly uninteresting. Like right. water polo, you're 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 playing a you're playing a sport and you're throwing balls and you're screaming at the ref and you're like beating up other people or you know, like all these things and and or you're a swimmer, right? People are coming to watch you, or you do is something interesting like basketball, because swimming and water polo are not that interesting, right? <laughs> so you have all these different options. Rowing, people can't even watch you row. It's a two thousand meter course. So the spectators literally see you in the last 200 meters or wherever they happen to be, to be sitting, they miss the epic nature of the race, which is this like just knife fight all the way down the course. And even when they see it, they're like, that's it. That's all you guys do. Like for real, you just sit backwards and halt. And you're like, yeah, that's, it's kind of my, 
it's what I'm into. It's just <laughs> yeah. so you, you got so it really for in, school though, right? No, 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 oh. no, no. I did it for free. Oh, you did it for free. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's not the kind of thing that that is. It, rowing is not a um, a revenue producing sport, so it's not okay. like basketball. Or, or uh, I mean, there were some scholarships, but they were primarily for people coming from overseas or or things like that. But if you're just yeah. an average dude, even if you're successful, they're kind of like, hey, I'm going to give you 500 bucks from books. What do you think about that? <laughs> <You're> like, Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Book, Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much, right? It's it's pretty ridiculous. So, so yeah, again, rowing offered this great opportunity to be in college, be on a D1, potentially national championship team, and come from nothing which in shaping your perspective on success is incredibly important because it it stops it stops you from thinking that if you haven't been doing this your whole life you're you're dead look you you played sports in high school right yep. mm -hmm. okay great you had to know people at 16 and 17 who were like phenoms right yep. they were like incredibly physical incredibly gifted everybody all the coaches are just like damn that guy has it. like this is it right right well unfortunately 16 and 17 year olds haven't been grinding for 20 years so it creates this false sense of kind of like predestined success where it's like right. look that guy's six five he was going to like, I'll never be six, five. He was going to be successful no matter what. And I'll never be that, but it betrays the reality of success, which is you can be six foot, not six, five and learn how to grind, learn how to produce success over a long enough period of time. And homeboy that's six, five is going to give up because when his natural talents run out, he doesn't have that nastiness that you need to get through the next 10 years. So I think it's one of those things that rowing offers, which is, no, 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 you're terrible, but you're getting better. Yeah. And if you keep pushing, you can compete with the best people in the country. And so I think that that was one of those instructive things as a young person. Yeah. And I think it's pretty funny too. You talk about those and I just, you just kind of have flashbacks to school and you're like, there were people who worked twice as hard as the other people, but they weren't as talented. So they would get to a certain way, but there was all these guys who were like, Oh, he's going to be the best. This he's going to be the best that. And then they peak, right? They peak when they're freshmen right. or they peaked when they were in eighth grade and they looked really good in eighth grade and they get to the high school level. Like as a baseball coach and you see these kids that, Oh, he hit lots of home runs as a little leaguer and he's going to be this and that. Right. And then he, he grows up, he gains 20, 30 pounds. He gets kind of lazy. He thinks that he's the best, you know, or whatever. And then next thing you know, someone's outworked them someone's outplayed them someone's right. better than that because you're willing to work harder and right. i think that that's right. what the thing is with success it's like how hard are you willing to work anything is possible no matter what but you have to be willing to put in the work and i think a lot of people are lost on that they think that you know being an sat prep what would we call you sat prep teacher yeah i'm a i'm a i was a tutor a college counselor essentially yeah okay so when you do that, you have these kids that come in and they think, oh, I'm just going to take it one time. I'm going to be done and, and it's going to be great. And then they fail at it. And they're like, either they come to you and they come work more, they work harder, they get better. Or they're like, I'm not going to college. I'm not going to do, you know, and they fall right. off the, they fall off the horse. So, yeah, it's a, it, it, especially dealing with younger people. It's a very difficult thing because what's really interesting now is so the SAT became um, optional for most schools uh, during and and for a lot of schools they just went blind during the pandemic because students specifically in California couldn't get testing locations because all the high schools shut down so they were like well we can't really require this and for the students that that can't even get it it's not even really fair to consider it right so like we should just essentially not look at it for a couple years so that happened for a period of time, but then other schools said, okay, but wait, this is a valuable uh, metric to figure out how successful, it's a predictive tool to figure out how successful right. students will be. So they said, well, let's make it optional. But students realized really quickly that it was no longer, look, I need to do as well as I can, and that's the goal. The goal became, I need to do poorly enough that my parents will not make me submit this, <laughs> right? Because say they needed a 1300 and they were at 1100 even if they knew they could get to 1300, but they thought it would be a difficult thing. They're like, oh, well, maybe if I just do 
poorly enough, my parents won't make me keep taking this. Because they're like, if I get a 1200, then I need to be at a 1300. They're going to make me take it again. I'll get like a 1250 and then I'll get to 1300. But if I get like a 1070, if I do worse, then they'll just throw their hands in the air. They'll be mad at me, but I'll, I'll be off the hook for all this stuff. So, you know, it, it, it developed this really, a really weird dynamic. But even in the SAT, just like we were talking about before, you have people that come and they feel like their success is predetermined. They're like, look, I've never been good at math, right? Or I've never been good at English. Or this kid over here, he got a 1500 without studying because he's so smart. It's it, it's exactly like the guy's 6'5", and he's always been a great athlete. Right. But th- one of the things that was unique about the the tutoring experience, at least what people reported when working with me, is that there was this aspect of like, look, I don't really care. I don't care if you're 6'5", I don't care if you're 6'1", I don't care if you're in calculus, I don't care if you're in geometry. We're going to grind the same way. And most of the calculus kids had always been told, oh, you're so smart, like you're doing really, really well. And most of the kids that were not that smart in, say, geometry or, or algebra two, and and you know, it's not that they were dumb; they just weren't they weren't the calculus students. They had always kind of been caught on, like, listen, I know math is really hard for you; just kind of do your best. Like, you don't have to do this in college. <laughs> and both of those things betrayed the student's potential, right. because neither person had been introduced to an academic grind. Every athlete understands an athletic grind, like run faster, try harder, throw up, get up, keep going, right? Every athlete worth their salt understands that. But from an academic standpoint, nobody grinds students like a sports coach. And and so that was one of the things that that, um, people people really appreciated about the program. It's like, I don't care. Like you could be in calculus, you could just jump. Like we're, we're pushing both people as hard as possible. And, you know, young people respond actually. Yeah. Well, that's interesting too. So now you're now you're here. Are you continuing to do the tutoring now that you're here? Or are you just kind of doing it from distance, or are you shifting gears and doing something different? So, that's a great question. So the the in person stuff is, I think tutoring is best in person. Okay, uh-huh. and so there there were there were many people that said, "Hey, can we keep going but keep doing this virtually?" And it's like that's you're not going to be best served by a virtual, virtual dynamic, just because you can't, I can't push you the same way. My jokes are delayed by like half a second. So the punchlines don't hit. Like there, there are all these problems with virtual tutoring. And I don't know when you're lying to me. And by the way, I don't think you're a bad person as a 16 year old and you're lying to me. We all know you lie. So like, I just need to be able to catch you to save you from yourself. Cause you're right. probably pretty adept at lying. So anyway, the, for me, I didn't want to keep going with the, with the virtual virtual work. So I, I set up a, I set up a tutoring company that I had actually known for, for quite some time. And I was like, listen, you got to take over my in-person stuff. But what I think is, is really interesting is that there are about 7 million, what I've come to understand is there are about 7 million homeschooled students and that number is increasing. And those students in general are, are very underserved and, and their parents are not interested in the stuff that a lot of schools are peddling these these days so i don't i don't know if you know anything about the california school system but they have gone they have gone dark yeah let's let's just we'll we'll just kind of preface that by saying that (coughs) you moved you i grew up in idaho i met you in idaho you have now moved here from idaho so it's a little bit different here than it was down there and i moved from california mess it's uh it's an absolute train wreck. So just, just a small background on this California. So I, I should be the poster child of everything that California intends to produce. My, my grandfather came from Mexico and moved to Arizona. He fought in world war II when he was like 16, 17, had, uh, got married, had my dad had six kids, right. And moved from Arizona to Southern California worked. He worked nights or went to school at nights and got his aeronautical engineering degree over like eight years. So die hard worker while he had six kids, you know, did all this stuff. My dad, my dad is, um, I think he was the fourth of the six and they were broke. And like they had a, they were living in Costa Mesa, but back when my dad was a kid, Costa Mesa was very underdeveloped. So they didn't even have asphalt, you know, streets. So my dad graduates from high school, barely graduates, goes to Vietnam, comes back, uses the GI bill 
he becomes a doctor. He goes to public school growing up, goes to U uh, UC Davis for undergrad, goes to UCSF for med school. I'm born, I'm the fourth kid born when he is in med school in the city, right? To grind my parents break up, but I go to public school the entire way through. So I go to, you know, this school in Concord, which is actually, it ranked lower than the schools in Compton. Okay. So the school I was going to was wow. not great, but it was in Northern California. And so nobody really knows about it. It's like LA doesn't, is not the worst school system in California. There are school systems in Northern California. They're hor horrendous, yeah. but I like claw my way up. I go to UC Berkeley. I graduate. I start a tutoring company the week I graduate because I fell in love with teaching and, and wanted to be a teacher. I theoretically, like if you look at that immigrant family, public school system, clawing their way to the top, it should be everything celebrated. But now in the California public school system, I am everything wrong with education. It has created a disparity, yeah. right? The, like I, I went to Ignacio Valley High School. A lot of students went to Ignacio Valley High School. Not a lot of students ended up in the town I was in. It was in Danville. It's this great town in, in California and, and, you know, pretty pricey. And, and a lot of people want to be there. Not everyone ended up there. And all of a sudden, it's a problem that I ended up there because our school system produced disparity on the back end. It's like, well, of course it produced disparity. You gave everybody the same trash education. Some people ran with it. Some people didn't. W yeah. What do you want to do? But they're so focused. The California school system is so focused on equality of outcome that they are actually hamstringing successful students, giving way more resources to, to students that are either – struggling or just don't care. And I'm yeah. not, look, I struggled as a young person. I had speech therapy and I, I was dyslexic and all of these things. I was very thankful for the resources that I got. That's all well and fine. But those, those specialty resources ended in like fourth grade, you know, like I didn't continue getting counselors and help and all this stuff through high school. So it's a, it's a very backwards thing. They're focused exceedingly now on, on transgender and, and uh, gender ideology, like the, the, the number of accommodations that they're making for it's, it's not existing students. They want, they really want to be observed as having all the resources. Should a student come forward and say, Hey, I feel this way, or I feel that way. It's, There's it's unbelievable. And they're, yeah. There was some. I think I was listening to one of your podcasts, and you were talking about how if a if a there's a certain age that they don't even have to tell the parents that they're taking them to Planned Parenthood. Oh yes. So and this is one of the things that, that people don't ridiculous. understand. Ridiculous. Yes. So and California educators have become this. I don't, I don't even know how you would describe them. They view themselves as like these surrogate parents where mm -hmm. it's like they now are the compassionate frontline, you know, defense of a child's life. So there's a law mandatory in California. This will blow your mind. At 12 years old, the school is required to offer reproductive services, transportation mm -hmm. to services and counseling at 12 years old without informing the parents. So they can literally be taking a sixth grader to an off-campus site to get reproductive care without informing the parents. And of course, somebody will say, well, you know, there could be a case where, you know, the parent doesn't agree or doesn't want to care for the child in this way or doesn't want to offer these things. Okay, perhaps. And I'm going to be the first to say that's a very rare instance. And second, how are we making laws to circumvent parental care. Like right. parents should have the right to, to, to take care of their children's health in ways that they see fit. And perhaps you, the teacher don't agree, but it's not your place to, you're teaching like history yeah. to a 12 year old. Like you're, you're not the, you're not the parent. And by the way, when this school year is over and they're no longer in your class, where are you? Are you picking up the the pieces if something falls apart? No, you just, right. oh my gosh, I loved having you in my class. I mean, come back whenever you want and it's over. So there are all kinds of things like that where California is systematically removing the checks and balances that were supposed to separate this, the public school system and, and the powers and the intention of the public school system from the parent. It's like, this is not, this is not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. I could, I get really dark on this because it bums me out as a parent. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing that, you know, you kind of touched on a little bit too, is, you know, I, I lived, 
so I was born down there. I moved up here when I was 10 and then I, I grew up in Oregon and had, went through the Oregon school system. Stuff like that was like, you had to have your parents sign a waiver to say that you could even go and have sex education. Now you can't even, now it's like, ah, we can do whatever we want. But the thing that I see the biggest thing and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's always been this since that no child left behind deal down there that they are teaching, like you were talking about, the people who need all the resources, they're teaching down to that and then not challenging the people who are higher up. I have a daughter who is at a fourth grade reading level and she's in second grade. And next year, my wife just met with the principal. They're going to put her in fourth grade reading class if they if she continues to test as high as she does instead of leaving her where she's at and not challenging her and it seems like that's what's going on down there. They're just not challenging the people who are higher level. They have to do it on the, on their own. There, there is that, and I, I think the problem, no child left behind produced a lot of problems. But I think one of the biggest things driving this is that you don't want to appear to be catering to somebody who's already successful. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Like they want equality of outcomes. So they're like, okay, look, this person is already understanding English. This person is already doing this. So we're not going to offer them any specialty things. We can't, we want equity. They can already see over the fence. We don't need to give them a bigger box to stand on to see over the fence. We need to help this other person. And so your daughter would absolutely, uh, or excuse me, not absolutely. She'd have a high likelihood of just being like, okay, well, look, you're doing fine. And we're moving on to the other, to the other kids that are, yeah. You know, and they're worried about there. Th there's this thing called a Prism Club in in the school district we came from. Okay, Prism Club is this LGBTQ alliance club that was intended to start in it'd be high school stuff. Now, look, you want to have a club for that with 16 year olds that understand what's going on. Look, that be my guess, whatever. But then it got pushed into middle school, and then it got pushed into elementary school. Yes. Okay, so you have these clubs that are being promoted during lunchtime. Because for a number of reasons, you have clubs that are being promoted to nine and 10 year olds. And, and it's like, wait, are you explaining to them what this is? Which they're not, by the way, because I know several people whose kids had joined this club and they didn't understand the, the nature of the club. Then when they find out, they realize uh, I have a dear friend. His daughter essentially got catfished into being president of the Prism Club. And she didn't even know what it was. And they're like, we're all about inclusion. We're all about making friends with everyone and accepting everyone. And she's this wonderful, I think she's in fifth grade. She's this wonderful little girl. She's like, oh, that sounds great. Like, yeah, we should be friends with everyone. Like, why not? And then she finds out it's for, you know, this LGBTQ alliance. It's like, well, how far are you explaining this? And if you're explaining it to the degree that you should to actually get the point across, not that just not like Wes and I are friends, right. but Wes and I are really good friends. Like, if you're explaining that, why are you explaining that to a fourth grader? Right? Like, why, it's not. And my question is, is did they have the choice to like, was there a flyer that went home with the parents who actually understood what their kid was getting into? Or was the kid just like, oh, it's lunchtime and we're going to this, you know? Right. I mean, right. So you have a, you have a certain degree of consent, but check this out. Another friend is it, her, uh, her son happened to be in this, uh, in the prism club and you know her son is her son and, and somebody came up to her um uh, a very close friend and said hey is your son does your son identify as they instead of he and she said well you know not that i know of but i wouldn't be surprised and you know it, her son is her son i have no i've never met the, uh, the young man and you know he, he feels however he feels that's not my point the point is that this person says to my friend she says well i met this girl at the park who knows your son as an, and is in the prism club with your son. And she said that your son identifies as they, and I don't know what, uh, what comes with that, but this person was incredibly distraught in tears because now this son has been persuaded to divulge intimate and personal things about himself to other like 12 and 13 year olds that are then telling perfect strangers at the park. It's like, what kind of club is this? And yeah. the parent is the last one to find out. And there, there are all kinds of problems with, look, everybody wants compassion, right? You want compassion. I want compassion. We're like, you know what, Wes? We're, we're going to make an increased compassion club. Okay, well, that's that sounds like a great idea because we feel that there's a problem in the world where we lack compassion. But the ultimate problem is creating a greater compassion club where everyone's compassionate and you can come and say whatever you want actually has problems. 
And we don't want to talk about the problems like a 12 year old diverging in uh, divulging intimate details about themselves to other 12 year olds. We don't right. want to talk about that. We want to focus on that. We're increasing compassion, but to say that there are no downsides to this, or potential fit pitfalls just betrays common sense. So yeah, California education system is a little, uh, a little off the rockers at this point. <laughs> so you're, yeah. So your podcast, and we've talked about it a little bit, it's called the engine of Matt Todd, but it's, you, you talk about, you dive into a lot of these things. And what I can say that I really appreciate is like, I like listening to, like you had someone who was in talking about like the mask mandates and things like that going on in California. And I appreciate the fact that you were willing to like voice your opinion and say, you know, I don't agree with that, or I don't agree with this. And I think that that's something that we lack a lot of time. It's like, we can't have that conversation anymore, whether you disagree with something that I say or whatever, it's like, Oh, you disagree. I'm out. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. We can't have that conversation. How do you navigate that? I mean, that's, that's just a, it's object, it's objectivity. It's like, this is, we don't get this anymore. We, the media is not that way. Um, right. What got you yeah, into I doing that and, and doing what you're doing? So the podcast started because I would have these, I would go on these rants with my students in class and I'd have a small, small classroom of like six to seven, you know, 16, 17 year olds. And they bring in all kinds of stuff that they're hearing from school. So, you know, this one girl, uh, this, uh, happened in, um, it was like spring of 2021. This girl comes in and she's struggling in math and, and not really struggling. She's just not doing as well as she wants. So she's like, well, I mean, gosh, it's really, you know, a problem because society has made me bad at math. I was like, wait, what? What did you say? So we get into this argument because she's like, no, I studied this in sociology. I studied that like women are discouraged from studying math and they're put down. I was like, listen to me, I'm a man and I'm sitting here trying to help you get better at math. So like, what are you talking about? And so we would get into these kind of arguments or have deep dives on, you know, relationships or, or whatever it is. So I started making these shorter podcasts that were based on ideas that uh, that came up in class. And my students really started enjoying them. And then everything got pushed into uh, COVID. And then there were there were things that came up in the community, like mask mandates, that nobody was having good faith conversations on. And good faith conversations as in, look, Wes, you could tell me I'm an idiot for wearing my hat forward and you're a gangster because you wear your hat backwards. <laughs> and, you know, like we go back and forth and I'm like, yeah, that's whatever, man. I don't want skin cancer on my nose. Like, so I'm going to wear the bill forward. <laughs> like we could go into this and and nobody was having that be, it, you know, the more the media pushed things and it's not like COVID invented this, but we started having things of real, real consequence that were becoming polarized. And it was like, we, we can't do this. I mean, we're all locked in our houses. Like, shouldn't we have a discussion about this? So the, the podcast became this community kind of thing where parents were coming on and voicing out issues or even administrative superintendent of education came on, the, the, the president of the teachers union was coming on. We were having these conversations where people had a place where they would realize really quickly, oh, I can be honest here. And it's like... It, the irony of this is I'm going to say it's like actually a safe space, right? <laughs> not, not safe space in that nothing, no one will get offended, but safe space in you can offend me. I can offend you and we'll still keep talking and we're still going to drink a beer after this conversation. Right. And that it's a very funny thing because like, look, when you interview people, how do you get people comfortable? I just, I try to be myself. I try to make it like a conversation. I mean, you just sit down and you just, you know, invite them to kind of tell their story and kind of share what they have. And yeah, I mean. Sure. Talk about yourself. That's always an easy one, yeah. right? But like, it, it, there's a, there are a few things that I've realized in conversations get people going really quickly, right? Because I may not trust you. So no. I may, I, you may say like, tell me about your career and I'm going to give you a very canned response. And then I may not trust the audience, even if I trust you. So I give a, a more open response, but like still a little canned. There are all these layers of trust that go into actually portraying yourself as who you are, right? Divulging, being vulnerable. And right. so the, they're speaking to people like, again, the, the mass person. I was like, you know, well, hang on. I don't necessarily agree with that. One of the keys to being able to have those conversations and she, the, my guest on that particular podcast is a very passionate mom. She feels incredibly, 
she feels an incredible burden with with trying to get people to understand that she doesn't feel the masks are correct and she she has all these studies backing her and she thinks that the community is being really hurt by this so she's incredibly intense about it and i appreciate that about her she's not she's not sitting on a fence she's she's going one way but she and i don't agree on all the details but to have that conversation without either one of us blowing up you have to uh, very quickly establish that there's a level of there's a level of trust. Like you can say something and maybe you slip on it and I'm not going to jump on you. And then there's a level of me saying something dumb in a playful way that allows you to realize like, oh, Matt's not being as careful as other people with his words. One thing I did with young people to get them to open up, I swear right away. They come into class and be like, how the fuck are you? And they freak out because they're, they're like, oh, I guess I'm okay. But you have to offer up your neck and say, right. look, if you want to go home, and complain about the fact that Matt swore and he was he made bad jokes. You can do that and you can get out of this. But you also know that I'm just going to be straight with you. And so people got really comfortable in the class. They're like, oh, Matt's going to tell me exactly how it is. He's going to make bad jokes. He makes fun of himself. He makes fun of me. So we don't have to have this cagey, canned interaction. Right. And that's what I do on the podcast as well. It's allowing people to, to develop a very quick sense of trust, not betraying that trust throughout the two hour conversations. Sometimes they go very long and the more people realize like, oh, it's okay. We can talk the better it is. But right. that sense of, oh, this is okay is exactly what we're lacking in society, in my opinion. Like there's never a sense of, oh, it's okay to say something dumb or it's, oh, it's okay to, you oh, know, no, potentially yeah. offend someone. I mean, that's, that's the nature of it. Yeah, because it can kill you. I mean, like, I'm, I'm surprised that any of these people, you know, are willing to come talk to you because of their uh, out of fear of what could happen to them for if they did say something wrong. You know, I mean, I always went with that. It, it was just kind of the same thing when I was teaching. I wouldn't get in trouble. You know, like I, I didn't want to get in trouble for cussing. And I did it every once in a while. And I'd look over at the TA and I'd be like, what the? And and then she'd be and then she'd look at me kind of funny and I'd be like, sorry. She's like, oh, it's OK. My parents talk like that all the time. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, right. It's like you, you, you're so guarded because everything that you can do is under a microscope and you could be just destroyed for it. I mean, even it's, it's weird. It's just, it, it doesn't make sense to me. But you know what? I think that the destruction aspect of it comes from like, if you see an aggressive dog, okay, the dog starts running up to you. If you turn around and run, that dog's going to chase you down and jump on your back. If you stand your ground, you don't even have to do anything. You just stand there. That dog's going to think twice about it. He's like, oh, this person's not running away. So right. the, it's. I don't even necessarily know if it's an aspect of that we are that easily canceled as much as we participate in canceling. No, like we allow okay. it to happen. Yes, and perhaps I'm, mis, I'm miswording that. There are. There is an aspect of, of risk every time you publish anything and be it a conversation or a, a post on social media, like whatever it is, somebody can find a problem with it. But there's also an aspect of participation in your own cancellation where somebody says, oh, you said something racist. And you're like, no, I didn't. No, I, no, I have friends that are minority. Like anytime you start defending yourself, it's over. Right. So for me, when I started getting into conversations with people, um, especially about real topics, I realized there can be no defense. Like if you say something terrible or really dumb, yeah, fine, apologize. But if you wait to apologize when it, until when somebody is actually already accusing you of something, you've already missed the mark. Like if you do something dumb and you say something dumb, apologize right away. It's like, hey, I, I misspoke or, you know, whatever. And then you move on. But if if you let the mob start, you know, gaining momentum right. and then you start backpedaling, that's when the dog is chasing you down and it's going to jump on your back. I think people and my guests have experienced this as well. Some some guests have come on and talked about very loaded topics. And I I would always tell them beforehand, I'm like, listen, no matter what anyone says, do not apologize and don't backpedal. And overwhelmingly, they the whatever flack they've gotten. They just stood their ground and then the person disappeared into obscurity, right? Whatever the yeah. critic said, they're like, oh, it's not gaining momentum. Like this person's not participating in the criticism. Yeah, it's and I like think that's what a lot of people need to do. What Dave Chappelle did 
and what Patton right. Oswalt did. You know, it's like, oh, I'm so sorry, and I said what I said. You know, I mean, it, it is it is what it is, and so I, I, that's that makes a lot of sense. People coming after right. you and just participating in it, and now backtracking on everything that you did, whether it's disbelief or not, then it's yeah, you're not holding your ground. If I may ask you a question, so you you've been doing this for some time now, and you you've published tons and tons of different episodes and interviews and thoughts. You must have had backlash at some point, and perhaps you haven't. Perhaps it's all glowing reviews, but even even uh, a DM or or something like that, where somebody attempts to persuade your individual action or your thoughts or your conversations, and you may not even know them, but it, have you had things like that? And if you have, how did you, how did you handle them? It's kind of weird. I don't necessarily know that I have, like, I, I haven't had anyone kind of complain or, or say anything. It's, it's weird because I, I handle it a little bit more with like kid gloves. I don't want anyone to be really offended by anything. I want, mm -hmm. I want the story to be shared. I want people to know that you can build something this way or however you got where you are, you know, and it, I don't really, meander into controversial stuff. So I haven't really had that happen yet. I, I do, you know, like I have people who said, um, like, well, people just don't listen, you know, like they don't listen to the podcast. I mean, like on social media posts and stuff like that, I've had people come back at me, but I just, I don't listen. I mean, I don't care. It doesn't, it, it I'm doing what I want to do. And, um, uh, but I don't really, I don't really venture into the, you know, I don't take a position but I have sure. a position. I have my, I have a position and I'll, I'll have a conversation with people about that position elsewhere, but I just don't feel like, like my political beliefs is not something that I think that anyone needs to know unless I feel like sharing them with them. I just, I would like to know why you think your way and, and, and what makes you think that that's, you know, it, when it becomes like a political conversation, it's like, I don't, I mean, I understand your side. I understand my side. I, you're not going to convince, I mean, you could convince me if you give me a good, a good enough reason to believe it, but I don't see the reason. Right. So I'm not believing it's like making your own right. choice instead of being trained. Like Adam Carolla says, that he's like, they're crate training. These kids are teaching them that they have to do this. They have to do this. They have to do this. And they're making them wear their masks down in California. It's like, he, he keeps saying that over and over again. They're crate training them. They're crate training them. Get in the crate, do what they want. If you don't, it's about control. And that's really where this world is going is how hard can we control you into doing what you want? And, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I try to, you, you, I try to stay out of it. That what, what you hit on right there at the end is kind of what I was, what, what, what appears to be happening. Okay. So you, You've developed a platform. You've developed, you know, a, a, a loyal fan base. You have this thing, right? And a lot of times what's really amazing is people can hijack that thing and take it from you right. by employing criticism and persuading you that their criticism should be more important than your autonomy. I, I did an, for instance, I did an interview. And again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I come out and say wild things. What happens right is that uh, I want to talk to both sides. Okay. So yes. earlier in the pandemic, um, it was like fall 2020, excuse me. We were having these, uh, the, the board of education in the school district was getting, uh, the, they were up for election. So there were three spots. So I was interviewing people about what they thought about the individual candidates or the issues coming up. I mean, nothing crazy. Right. So I interview one group of women and it was a great interview. It was like two hours and we were like drinking and, you know, talking trash, but also hitting some really valuable points. And it was a very popular interview. And the opposition came, came at me so intensely. They were writing these negative reviews on, on Apple podcast and going to my, you know, like my Facebook page as if like, I care about the reviews on the Facebook page, <laughs> right? They're like, they're crushing it. They're like, this guy supports bullies. And, and they were writing and sending me all these personal messages saying like, if you continue to support bullies like this, if you do not remove that podcast, then I just cannot, I cannot tolerate listening to you anymore. And you've really lost the sense. It's like, I don't even know who you are. You're like, this isn't even your name. You're DMing me right. from like, you know, and I offered of course to have each of these, each of these critics on the podcast to tell me what they were thinking about the issues we discussed or the people that I interviewed cowards, all of them, of course, yes. like nobody wanted to show their face. So it's, 
it's a power thing. It's a control thing. Yeah. And as we become independents, as you are, as I am, as we become independents, the establishment and the, the standard social happenings freak out because they're like, look, you shouldn't be able to just jump on a mic and say whatever you want and broadcast it if I disagree with you, right? And yeah. and that's that's when they employ these very classic kind of shaming uh shaming tactics or or blacklisting tactics and all of these other things but again if you don't run away from it if you if you just stand your ground all of a sudden they fade into obscurity if you engage and start apologizing or backpedaling then you just have to admit you're not in control of what you're doing at all like right. if if somebody can dm me from an anonymous account and make me feel so bad about a podcast that I take it down, that I just have to admit, I am not in charge of the podcast anymore. Right. I'm not in charge of my own thoughts. I do it only at the pleasure of these anonymous people. And that's what I would love to see stay in California, yeah. <laughs> never come this way. Because, I mean, we had a, we ultimately, I moved my whole family. It's like, this yeah. is not a community that I can keep existing in happily. I had too many problems with the education system and I had I had too many problems with the way that the social social dynamic was playing out. And to come up here and meet you and meet the other people that I have, it's like, oh my God, you're human beings again. This is amazing. It's crazy. And they're and you you'll you know, you know this Idaho people and you know the people in general, they're just like, just don't change it. Just like it's right. that's it. You're here. You came here for a reason. Remember why you came here and think about why you came here. And right. I don't, I haven't met a person that I dislike, you know, that's come up here and obviously I was born there, but I don't, you know, I've been here 30 something years. So it's not like it's, you know, this is home. <laughs> so, right. And, and right. I, we feel like, I feel like we should be welcoming no matter what, you know? Well, I think the, I think the good news is I've talked to a lot of people about this um, mm -hmm. as I was leaving and then people, people that I've met here, you have to want to move to Idaho, right? Like it's not a, it's not like, a, oh, the Bay Area, SF Bay Area got too expensive. I need to find cheaper housing, right? Like it, even if you leave the state, you're going to like Arizona, maybe go to Oregon, you know, like Colorado is really popular. There are all of these other destinations that you can hit. To make it up here, you have to want to be here. And so I think in that way, Idaho does a very good job of forcing people to self-select because you're not accidentally ending up in the Boise area. Like you're, you're intentionally coming up. So in that way, everyone, so I live in the Dry Creek area, Dry Creek Ranch, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Everyone here that I've met and tons and tons of people in this, in this community, all similar, all similar. And again, we don't all agree on all issues, but they're all seeking this, this open, you know, human decency relationship. It's funny because I think that like they're they're seeking asylum. Yeah, <laughs> everybody calls themselves refugees. Like you're a refugee too. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this guy moving in, uh, moving in across the street, and my wife goes over and helps him. They're taking this family photo, trying to set the iPhone up in the middle of the street. So my wife goes over and helps him with this photo, and she's talking to them. And the husband said, "Yeah, you know, we moved up from uh, essentially Silicon Valley area." Uh -huh. And he said, "I got to the point where I was speaking. I think he was speaking with one of his neighbors, and the woman was so impassioned. She was so intense about whatever particular." issue they were going off of and you know pick one because everybody just gets polarized there right. and the guy says listen to me listen you're not going to convince me in these five minutes but just do me a favor because i want to hear you give me something to think about that i can go away and think about over the week and then you know like we can come back and talk about it again next weekend but like you're not going to convince me right now so just get in good faith give me something to really consider because i will go and consider it and his neighbor who he was talking to couldn't do that. She was just so intense about like, you don't understand. There's no way you could disagree with this. Like I am the right answer and I'm trying to help you see. And he was like, what are you doing? Like, there's no humanity. There's no humility there. It's, it's, oh, I don't know. I don't know how we got on talking about California. It's too oh, we're dark. Good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, you, yeah, I know you're, we're running out of time here, but I just want to, you know, let's tell everyone where they can find you wherever you're at. The podcast is called The Engine of Matt Todd. 
Um, that's right. That's the on. podcast called Ninja Matt Todd. The, the educational programs I have are up on mtuclass.com. So I have my my um, online SAT prep. And, and again, I know Idaho is much more much more classic with regard to standardized tests, which is awesome. I mean, you guys do not do not think that the SAT is racist and horrendous and discriminatory. <laughs> so yeah, I have that. But again, the Ninja Matt Todd, and uh, I have some other really awesome um, educational tools coming out for for homeschool the homeschool community in particular coming up soon, which are, which good. You can see previews of those on uh, Matt Todd university, the Instagram page and, and all that. Well, it was great having you on. We have one last question that I want to ask you. This is the one that everyone gets asked, right? It's the million dollar question. Um, shows called shaping success. You know, we, and we try to define sex success for each individual because it's different for every single person. How do you define your success? Man, you know, you told me you were going to ask me this and I forgot, I forgot to come up with a good answer. So you're going to get the, you're going to get a real honest one. Um, so look, the death of happiness is comparison. That's a hundred percent true. So whatever you have, somebody has more. Um, and ultimately the worst comparison that I think people experience is them comparing what they thought their life would be to what their life actually is. So like you're your worst critic and you're going to compare yourself indefinitely. And we should have some degree of comparison because we set up plans, we set up goals and, and we need to know as human beings, okay, how am I individually shaping up to the goal I had for myself? But I think ultimately success comes down to the willingness to change whatever plan you had, whatever idea you had about where you would be today or tomorrow and be flexible enough to know that as you learn things and as you experience things, it might be different. You might end up in a completely different state meeting completely different awesome people, but it's having the capacity to switch those things up. That will be success for you, right? And, and if you don't like something in your life, change it, right? And that's success, being able to change it, having the capacity to change it and the foresight to change it and the courage to change it. But the success is almost always for the, the greatest successes in the world. They've almost unanimously said their great successes started with like a tragedy or a problem, right? And then they were able to create this incredibly envious uh, you know, life for themselves. So it's that capacity to change. It's that capacity to shift, become something different and stop judging yourself because we're ultimately going to be the things that get in our own way. That's great. I think, you know, like I, I learned over time that my competition is me and that's who I try to beat every single day myself, not, not someone else. You can be, you can have a podcast that has 10,000 downloads and I got one that five that has 500 and I'm going to try and beat 500. I'm not going to try and beat your 10,000 cause it's within me, not within you. Right. Right. So stop fighting yourself right? Stop being your own critic. And if you can look at yourself at the end of the day, no matter where you are and say like, Hey, you, you did well today and you have progress to make tomorrow, but you did well today, man, I don't care where you are in life. That's, that's your, that's ultimate success. You know, having that honest, honest appraisal of yourself in the dark, in the quiet, it's like, you did all right today. Yep. You can do better tomorrow, but you did all right today, man. You can sleep well if you can say that. Hey man, it's been awesome having you on here and I knew it'd be a really good conversation. I, I'm sure we could talk for hours on yeah. hours and we'll definitely, <laughs> well, I appreciate it. it. Yeah, We'll have to do it again because I, I think that there's so many things to unpack. So I really appreciate yeah, you taking the time. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Will. no, excuse me, Wes. I, I appreciate it. And again, we absolutely will get a, get another one in and uh, just tell me what whiskey you like. We'll make it happen. Oh, uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks buddy. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, that is the end of the show. Until next time, I want to challenge you to find the shape of your success.